Well, everybody, um, we're back again with the Hanging with Hank. And um, I have as my guest this time uh, another friend from, from way back. I'm, I'm going to stop counting years <laughs> the times with people because I can't understand this new arithmetic. Anyway, uh, it's a friend of mine I've known for a number of years who is an artist, but it's beyond being an artist. He's done a lot of different things, which we will learn about in this little hang. And I just want to introduce my friend, Judd Hart. How you doing, Judd? Hey, Hank. Happy <laughs> to be here. And uh, I'm flattered that you included me in with your other guests over time. I really am. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you consented to do it because um, the, the, it's kind of interesting, our connection, which I'll get into in a minute, but also some of the... Um, different things you've done done over over the years. So just to create a little context for all of you out there, uh, those of you who know me knew I grew up in the Bronx, and I had a friend in the Bronx named John Howe, who I met when I started college. He was still in high school, and John Howe was an artist. He um, graduated high school, this is the late 60s, went to New Mexico to study, and then wound up in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, teaching there. Uh, this brings us into like the early 70s. And he lived out there, and I would go out and visit him in Colorado. And John knew Judd, and that's how I met Judd. This is what, like 1970? 70... 72, 73. Yeah, 72, 73. So, and John passed away a, n a number of years ago, and uh, 1998, and uh, Judd and I have stayed in touch. But there was a lot of interesting time spent when I went out there to Colorado and the judge came to New York sometimes with John to hang out, but I got to know the judge. And I actually worked with Judd in one or two instances that we will we will talk about. But um, but to begin, like, so it's Denver that you started out in? That's where you grew up? I was born in Denver, yeah, in uh, Denver's first housing project. Hmm. Romantic times, Platte Valley housing, yeah. On my birth certificate it says, Mom, was a housewife, dad was a janitor, but she had graduated from college when she was 19, University of Kansas. And that's just wow. part of the dynamics of the time. But yeah, Denver, Colorado, I'm the oldest of uh, three sons. Mm. I was born in 1942. I'll be 80 next month. Wow. 80. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> that mean I met 50 years ago. That's like, Wow. Yeah. wow. And I'm really glad that we're, you know, stayed in contact, you know, over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but at, at what point did the art bug hit you? Now, if memory serves correct, I think when I asked you this question many, many years ago, the name Walt Disney popped up in the conversation. Am I yeah. off base? No, no. Okay. Because, uh, I always drew. In fact, one time when I was five, I, well, maybe I was six or seven, but my father was shining shoes for a church. We were going to mm -hmm. go to church. I drew his picture. But they knew who it was. It wasn't like, you know, Michelangelo, but it was like, well done for my age, drawing up my father's face. Parents were so proud they put it up on the wall, you know, like, wow, Chad, he's, what's he <laughs> of course, they, they would have said later, don't be an artist. That's like economically. But they put it up on the wall. But I used to have a terrible temper. And they did something to make me mad. I remember climbing up on this chair, tearing the picture off the wall and tearing it up, which, of course, meant I got. Oh, wow. But I always drew. I always started to think of myself as an artist. And then, uh, naively, of course, I, when I first saw Fantasia, when it was reissued in, like, uh, 1952, I remember being, like, Wow, that's what I want to do. Is uh, really my art as an animator? I thought, and then Peter Pan came out the, in '53, and I had an eye operation. I remember, and I couldn't go to the movie, and I was like so upset, you know, because I had this eye operation to short, you know. Anyway, anyway, I saw Peter Pan. I was in the movie theater all day. I went in in the first feature. Then they didn't ask you to leave after the feature ended. You know, you just sat there, people would leave. I stayed. I saw it three times in one day, something like that. 
So I used to draw in a wonderful Walt Disney, mm -hmm. I thought. And I used to write to the Disney Studios like, all the time, so much so that they wrote me back his, his personal secretary, whose name I still remember, <clears throat> Hazel Garner, wrote back. Wow. And so all the kids in you know elementary and middle school were like, Judd has some kind of inside track to it, <laughs> you know, he knows the stuff's coming out before it comes out, you know. Wow. So in 1950, probably 57, we went to California on a vacation, drove, you know, me and my family, three, two, me and my brothers, my father, and our new Ford Fairlane. Wow. <laughs> By this time, we had moved out of the projects. We moved out of the projects in 1955. So, get to LA. We're doing, you know, the tour thing. My uh, father had friends in uh, LA. My family had friends there. But I called the Disney Studios. I mentioned Hazel Garner's name, and they hooked me up with Hazel Garner, and she re recognized me, my name, as that boy from Denver who writes all the time. Wow. We set up a tour. I, I met Walt Disney, you know, just sort of, I met Mouseketeers, uh, Darlene and uh, Annette, which is funny, because later in life, Darlene, Post Mouseketeer, she ended up in jail for fraud, but that's a whole other story. And Darlene and I used to exchange letters on the, she wrote on Mouseketeer stationery. I should have kept that stuff, you know, yeah. right? So, uh, but then my hormones started to develop, so I became less, I still kept the art thing, but I was less focused on, you know, like when Cinderella came out, I was like, eh, you know, it's for yeah, girls, yeah. whatever. I'm not that wasn't the main driving force I, anymore uh, in your body. <laughs> I mean, I, had I was more attuned to the characters from Warner Brothers, you know, like uh, Daffy Duck, mm. uh, Bugs Bunny and all that. And I slowly become aware of the racism in the, anyway, that's, I don't want to get off track there, but yeah, Walt Disney, Fantasia. My hormones start to develop. I go to California with parents, tour the studio, start to go into other realms of art with my drawing, but that were a little bit sketchy in the sense that I used to draw little sexual pictures. And my, you know, for, for kids. I still remember in the sixth grade, I know you can edit all this stuff down, but it used to be these little plastic tubes. I don't know where I got it, man. <laughs> Looking the tube like this at the end, it might be a naked woman, like a spy. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember, yeah. <laughs> I had one, I'm at school, probably in sixth grade. I remember like, I was, sixth grade? I'm standing in line at Columbine Elementary where I was the track champ, which was good. I was a jock also. And I'm looking in this thing and then suddenly it's snatched out of my hand. He was the gym teacher, like, because he knew what it was. <laughs> and I still don't know where I got it, how I came up on it, I don't know. I just remember that happening like that. But uh, so I drew, I drew, uh, even if I jump forward to a, a class reunion for high school in 2010, East High School class reunion, I finally went to one because they kept trying to get me to come back. And I'm like, but I finally went to 2010. This has to do with drawing. So this girl, woman who was woman in 2010, she remembered me from East High School. I didn't remember her, but she says, you were always drawing. You were always drawing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was probably always drawing when I should have been finishing that test, you know, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's always for better or for worse. I've always thought of myself as an artist, you know, and. Uh, so was was it um, as you got older into your teens or whatever, did it did the, the medium start to shift around? Or was it mainly drawing or, or painting or <laughs> well, in was, high it, was it just whatever was in, in front of you? Although now I remember in middle in middle school, but then it was junior high because I was really good. And I remember I, I really got deep into drawing in perspective and with vanishing lines and vanishing points. And I still remember this teacher, they were like, you know, because I was, you know, it sounds funny to say now, but I was so good at it. 
they didn't know quite what to do with my skill set, you know, like mm. in Japan, they were just, wow, I used to be drawing all these cities. Then I got to high school and the teacher I still remember, Mrs. Edith Niblo, even though I was a knucklehead, sort of with a, a jock on one hand and then sort of a geeky guy with, you know, my art. I was all into Greek mythology. But Miss Niblo, you know, she saw something there, so she encouraged me. And uh, she was a great teacher, really. She was, you know. Mm. But then I, she recommended people that became a later influences that I had never heard of, of course. Of course, then they didn't have, there were, there were no black artists that I knew of, except maybe uh, a guy that went to for the late 1800s. What was his name? Uh, anyway. Yeah. He, had, he left the country. Anyway. Paul Clay was a European artist from uh, uh, Juan Miro. Anyway, they influenced me mm -hmm. via Miss Niblo. Yeah. Henry O. Tanner, that's what I was trying to think of. Oh. He's a painter, African, black man, who went to France in the late 1800s where you oh. get a better, a better uh, reception. It's interesting because I think I probably got in contact with you about this because so I'm a few years younger than you, but when I was in junior high school, oh, and, 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 and the, the second neighborhood I lived, the first neighborhood I lived in was predominantly black neighborhood. The second was predominantly white, but working class, Italian, whatever. And, yeah. with the junior, and the one black teacher I had was the art teacher. And his name was Al Hollingsworth. Right, famous. And, and, and as, but as a kid, it was just Mr. Hollingsworth, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And then I even remember when I was about, tw and I was interested in visual things too. Yeah. I think I'd seen an article in Ebony Magazine, because at this point, when you're a kid, you're thinking teachers, that's their full career. Now, right. you know, artists do these other things to pay the, <laughs> and later, this guy's a real deal thing. And then something, yeah. you know, over the years, and I mentioned to you about if you knew who he was. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was like, wow, Alec, Hank had Al Hollingsworth as yeah. a and then, and then backtracking about Disney too. The other thing recently that we I was in touch with you about was a documentary about the black animator at Disney. I forgot his name, Lloyd Norman Lloyd or Lloyd Norman or whatever. I, I remember. I, I yeah, I, was, uh, was a, he was one. Of, there was a lot of the first one there back way right back. Far between, but like when I went on that yeah. tour in 1957 of the studios, they were in uh, Burbank at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would take me on tour. At the time they were finishing, they were making the movie Sleeping Beauty, mm -hmm. the animated version. <clears throat> and uh, I remember in the animation process, you know, on the screen, you see the credits, they say animators, da, 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 but then you never, you don't see the names of the people that are actually what they call in-betweeners. Right. What the in-betweener is. Yeah, yeah. In between, yeah. In betweeners are like, okay, if the character moves from here to here, the in betweeners do every little, yeah. <laughs> so I looked into this room of in betweeners, and it was like hundreds of people doing the same thing in a way. And I was, even at that age, I was like, what, 15? Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. I, I didn't see myself starting as an in betweener. That was just my misplaced arrogance, but I'm just saying. Yeah, where I was, yeah. and I was already getting sort of like, yeah, Cinderella, now Sleeping Beauty. They did their nature films; those were good, like Vanishing Prairie. Yeah. But then, so I started to just go into the more hormone-driven. <laughs> <laughs> now, at art. this point, as your art stuff is developing, what other influences are coming in on you? Art? Is it any music? Any other things? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, starting to funnel well, in there this is an early incident that you know it's a it's a string that runs through there that leads up to this character uh jabbo but uh, when i was in the uh in junior high i was which we'll talk about <laughs> <laughs> that's just a tease for you out there wondering what i'll be go ahead when i was uh in junior high uh, they were then junior high was, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine. So when I was an eighth grader, they wanted me to draw, do the drawings for the ninth grade yearbook when I would be in, in the ninth grade. They knew that I was good, so they, you know, 
Mm -hmm. We want you to do the drawings for when you're in the ninth grade for the yearbook to create, you know, come up with something. So I came up with a couple of characters, black and white characters that were extreme in their look. So you had a crudish, you know, they had a black character and a white character. But the teachers, and all my teachers were white, uh, but the teachers freaked out on the black character. You know, like, oh, no, I don't know, Chad, I don't know. And so uh, ultimately I created a single character that was sort of a, the character almost looks Mexican in a way, <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. glasses and some kind of uh, hair and a, a dog. But the teacher's concern about the black character, I mean, at the time I was just, what, 12 or 13, so I wasn't analyzing it like, I mean, I mm -hmm. roughly understood it, but I didn't. So time goes by and uh, I'm starting to, probably not until early college really, which would be 1960 on, think how <clears throat> with the things, the racial setup even permeated the cartoon realm because there were no black cartoon characters on the daily comics page and if they appeared not on the you know it'd be kind of racist stuff going on mm -hmm. just like as far as asians go you remember the comic strip called black hawk it was like a these war these war you know white was war it a su superhero thing or something no they were like World War II remnants who were like, uh, you know, like uh -huh. almost soldiers of fortune, but they flew planes and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. They were like, you know, Steve Canyon or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they had a sidekick named Chop Chop. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, yeah, but that that was, yeah. Chop Chop was, you know, big buck teeth. And yeah. So I was like, I think I'd already seen some old, even uh, cartoons from the 30s that had racist imagery of uh, mm -hmm. black people, simplistic imagery, and even the troublesome, uh, the crows and Dumbo, you know, were like, could be funny, but it's uncomfortable laughter, like, yeah, yeah, you know, because they had this one crow that was walking around like, the crows are conferring what to do mm -hmm. with. Dumbo, how to help him. And then there's this one crow that's like almost fashioned after like a, a Willie Best character, or uh, he's walking around the other crows, you know, scratching his crow head and wondering how to get into the group. And so you'd be like in the movie theater. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> then there was Amos and Andy, which was actually a good show, but it was like yeah. such a narrow track for black people. It was like people thought, oh, this is black people. <laughs> Everywhere. So by the time in the early 60s, I, you know, and Denver was, you know, a lot different than, say, uh, New York or Los Angeles. There's not a lot of, there wasn't for me a lot of uh, cultural choices. It was a great town to grow up in, to be honest. It really was. But, and I had great parents in that regard. So, my art starts to go off track in a way and like I uh, you might look at some stuff and I can comment on it how uh, like I did this painting in uh, 1961 when I was 19 that was beautifully rendered abstract mm. and in the same year I did another a collage that was wrestling with uh, the look of African masks and the color is red, black, and green. And I don't know where I came across red, black, and green. Maybe looking at something in Africa or uh, Pan-African colors, I don't know. So I was wrestling with different notions, but I didn't have any real guidance per se, other than maybe in college, I stumbled onto the village voice. <laughs> I started seeing Leroy Jones wrestling with some stuff on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, read about the Dutchman, his play, and uh, yeah. some of his books like uh, Blues People and so on. An iconic book, too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Although years later, and I'm jumping around. I hope it's okay, Hank. No, no, just go, go. Yeah, yeah. Just later, because uh, Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, was very influential. He was a person that was at these crossroads of a lot of things. <clears throat> now, a lot of people won't remember his work. Some people will only know him as Amiri Baraka, and some people clearly remember him as Leroy Jones. Leroy Jones. And, uh, but years later, I read a book by his ex-wife called, the book is called How I Became Hetty Jones. Hetty Jones, okay. Yeah, it's a very good book. It gives insights into his struggles. And she was, you know, a young white Jewish woman married to Barack. The, 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 the Greenwich Village days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because with Barack, a lot of people were influenced to uh, with things that were going on up in Harlem, the black arts thing. Mm -hmm. and. He was at this crossroads. So out of that crossroads came people who were totally different, like Ishmael Reed, Stanley Crouch, who I call mm. Stanley Crouch. I know he's, but he rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he was he, contrary to be contrary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he was in sort of a leaning to the right element, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got Ishmael, who was pretty much like a wild card, great writer, fantastic writer. Yeah. So, so many influences and uh, so all those people you were checking into either reading or hearing about or well, kind of Baraka, consuming on some level. But Jones especially because that influenced me to eventually move to New York and Malcolm X. Mm. I wasn't so much. Yeah, I'm not religious. So I wasn't thinking the nation of Islam is my, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I respected it. Whatever happened in the 30s with Elijah Muhammad to make that kind of break. So I always look to people who made a break at their critical time, you know, like there's mm. before the break and then there's after the break when they decide I can't take this kind of shit this way. Yeah, you, yeah. You've got to change what, you know, you're like, uh... <clears throat> so. so you say you, you came to New York at what point now? Um. Is this before I, I met you? You're talking about, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Before yeah we so met, this uh, is like '60s. Or so. University of Denver, and uh, started out at University of Colorado in the track scholarship. Long jump, triple jump, right. and but I was up there just going crazy. I'm 18, away from home. I had a job mm -hmm. in the girls' dorm, which was not good, you know. Yeah, right. Well, it was good for me, but yeah. I only stayed there for two months. Mm. I left shortly after uh, uh, Kennedy was elected. I remember getting mm. on the bus going to LA when I was 18. And I wrote a letter that I sent from New Mexico to my parents so they would know I'm already on my way. <laughs> they would get the letter saying I left Tuesday and they get the letter on you know Saturday or something. Right. Sure. But anyway, I ended up back in Denver. There's, you know, adventure that happened in there, but that's, right. you know. and I went to enter DU as a student in January 61, got the track scholarship, mm -hmm. and as a side trip to that, interesting note, the guy who became my main track coach, mm -hmm. Edgar Lapinix, got busted years later as a Nazi sympathizer, which he was from Latvia originally, him and his sons. Yeah, he went on to coach the Mexican women's uh, Olympic team for... Uh, so you get to the school. Okay, I get to DU. Art department, I'm, I'm going to major in painting, which is like mm -hmm. economically absurd, but that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I'm influenced again, I'm feeling the influences of... Uh, people I've read, but I have no agenda per se. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of uh, easing into Negro to Black without mm -hmm. a roadmap for me in Denver. Mm -hmm. So in the mix, you know, I'm being social, I'm being, you know, jock, I'm a dickhead, I'm a crazy. I get married in, 19... yeah. <laughs> married in 1964, my daughter, Kimberly, she was born in 1965. 
Her mom was, <clears throat> her name is now Joy, oh, Joy Goodhart. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I graduated, from, we moved to New York. Okay, New York. So arrived with $100. And uh, I was driving a Plymouth push button drive. Remember those push button drive cars? It was like, Plymouth. I don't drive, you know. So. Oh, yeah, right. Plymouth. <laughs> I just were, been in the passenger seat. <laughs> they were, they were like, it was like you know everything was trying to be modern. Cars had fins and blah blah blah. And I so I got this used Plymouth Valiant that had push button drive, and mm. we drove to New York. I won't go into the whole long crazy story, but I so how long were you, you in New York? Yeah, when you got there, how long? Really, yeah. I worked at Texaco in the Chrysler Building as an accountant. Mm. Mm. That's a whole story in itself. So that's like I eventually get back to Colorado in the uh, late nineties. All right. So, what point do you, um, you know, as you navigate to me meeting you? At what point do you hook up with John Howe and these other people I wound up meeting when when I came out to visit you? Because I had a feeling when I, when I came out there that there was somewhat of a scene or something. I even think there was an organization called Splibs or something. Yeah, well, that's... That you all had. So, just yeah, that, like... I should have sent you that poster. That, that, that period of time, yeah. Yeah, well, How between... How did that happen? I moved yeah. back. I, I'll just inject I moved back in uh, late 66 with my family. We break up. Traumatic breakup. They moved back east to Washington, D.C., where uh, her father, who was a colonel in the army, was stationed. And uh, I get drafted eventually into the army, thanks to my father-in-law. And yeah, I get drafted, get out of the army in August of uh, 69. I was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. End up in San Francisco my first time. I'm there for a year and a half. Then I come back to Denver, thinking I'll be here there temporarily. And uh, I, but I start to make inroads. I start working at the Model City Cultural Center as the janitor. I needed a job, and this is leading up to John. And uh, they were about to fire me as the janitor, <laughs> which I understood because, I'm, anyway, it's a funny story. So. They rehired me as a silkscreen instructor. Then I was doing photography at the local in, uh, PBS station, Channel 6. I was doing a 10 part series on black art in Colorado. They wanted me to do the photography. I mean, it's not like I had a huge photographic track record. To be honest, I bought a hot camera just because I was standing around at the cultural center and this guy comes in the room like, does anybody want to buy this? Mm. I'm thinking, okay, the original owner is not going to get that camera back. So he looks at me and like whispers, you know, brother, brother, for you, I'll take $10 off. <laughs> anyway, I bought it. So I started working on the show and uh, part of the show was to go to Boulder to interview John Howe. And uh, that's why I met now, you, didn't know who, you didn't know who this was. They just told you know was, there's well, this guy, John Howe. Okay. You know, for him, it's, <clears throat> I'm this guy who shows up with a camera crew, you know, to talk to him. They're interviewing and I'm taking pictures. And then during that same stretch, I met Ed Rose, who was also in Boulder. He's, he's an artist, but he was working for IBM. Uh, he died in uh, about 2006, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that's when I met John and we hit it off you know, art-wise and socially. So I came out around about 73, 72, oh, 72. When, I, when I met you. Okay. And at that point, when I came to meet you all, was there a conglomeration of artists that kind of hung out regularly? I had, I had the sense it was a group of you all that kind of like Ed Rose. Well, whatever. in 73, it was, I met you at a party at John. Right, then. yeah. But in terms of just the scene there, in terms of the artists uh, around. Was the split, okay, there was a 
sort of. Uh, John was living in Boulder. I was sometimes I was trying to convince him, like, man, move to Denver, you know. Right, because we'd be back and forth. I would visit traveling between Denver and Boulder yeah, all the time. Yeah, right? yeah. That's right. And uh, then in 73 at the University of Denver during Black History Month, they had a big show. And so it was me, uh, John, Ed, Francis Sprout. He died. You never met Francis. Uh, Vernell de Silva and uh, Shalene Qualls. Shalene Qualls was a co-founder of uh, New Dance Theater, Cleo Parker Robinson's. Uh, mm. Shalene's a poet. She lives out here now. Anyway, mm. I say we'll call the show SPLIVS. <laughs> and it'll be an acronym for society. Please let it be so. But can you explain to some people the term SPLIVS, which I haven't heard for a long time? I know. Well, it was a... <clears throat> I liked it because it was a term that had admitted, you know, it was like a ter term of endearment between black people. Right, what, split, yeah. What a split, and it had no obvious root, you know? Cause it's, <laughs> yeah, because I haven't heard that in a long time. I think a lot of people are not even familiar with that slang, you know, split. No, they would say, what up, split? Split. Yeah, what's up, Splib? Yeah. In fact, I, before we did this, I kind of looked it up to refresh my memory. And yeah. different people, different places you go say it was derogatory, except it wasn't derogatory. It's kind of like, yeah. um, depending upon who said it, where it came from, which is all part of the history of the terms you've used for ourselves anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all these. So that's why when I got out there, I remember John used to use that term in New York. So the fact we had that organization, that group, or whatever you're explaining with the double yeah. meaning. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's a. I liked it because it had no obvious root, you know, that you could trace it to even in a negative way, you know, like a split is almost like just out of the air that somebody created some, I don't know where it originated. I have no idea. Mm. But the show, yeah, was uh, called Splibs at DU, Black History Month. It was a great oh, show. So that's, that's where I started out from. Yeah. Well, let me just so people know, uh, I just want to we we'll talk about this guy, John Howe, and figure I pop an image up here. And then there's another image of a group of artists, and maybe you can, you can, um, so okay. this is, um, there's John, John Howe. Uh, that was, a, no, that picture was from when he got married to Kathy. Oh, wow. I'm still learning about his history, you know, in so, terms uh, of yeah, so, But anyway, that's so people know that's John Howe that, yeah. that we knew. And he and I used to hang out a lot in New York in the summers and then and and then uh, Judd knew him. So yeah. that's, and and that that was very much John's demeanor, very cool and kinda of like oh, yeah. you know, I always had something in his hand, a drink in his hand. Drink in his hand with something happening. It's and and this is a this is a group of artists. John sitting in, now John was always cool because you, you can see John sitting there and he's got this uh, sweater around his. Yeah, he always has a sweater around his. <laughs> but can you, can you describe who some of these other fellows are? In the, okay, on the, uh, on the left is Paul Goodnight. He's still very active, a great artist, lives in Boston. In that picture, we're all part of a show that was at the Harriet Tubman Gallery that uh, I co produced with the woman in the middle, uh, Pat Welcome, which I mean, her name may not be, you know, I haven't seen her for years and years. And, you, and you're sitting next to her, right? Is that you? I'm between her and uh, Paul Goodnight. Okay, okay. Hey, Paul Goodnight's a great artist. He really is. Right. He's very prolific. And then uh, I told you my, well, yeah, Pat Welcome. And then John to uh, Pat left. Right. And next to John is, he's a photographer, but I can't remember his name. It was like a kind of Arabic, but I can't remember his name. Mm. And on the right is uh, Dennis Diddley, who later became Booza Moozy Maduna. Okay. Sculptor. He died in 2006, I believe. Uh, he lived. He was Bostonian also. So on in the picture, we had already John and I drove a ton of artwork from for the Denver artists from Denver to Boston for the show. Mm. It's in 1981, and uh, that was a great show. Yeah, Harry Tubman Gallery. And, so, uh, so now I'm moving to something, uh, a picture of another fellow. <laughs> That's 
That's when I was cute. Wow, I was very photogenic. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that was, uh, of course, the words above it were uh, added for another project, but that's from the movie uh, Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket singing mm. When You Wish Upon Us. And I always yeah. like those phrases up until this day because it's true for anybody. When you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who the you are. Right. So that picture was across the street from the housing projects. Mm. And there was this man uh, who used to come around with a horse and he had these little cowboy outfits and he would take pictures, you know, for whatever the cost was at the time. And so my, those are the houses across the street. Yeah. That's mm. 1947. So I was like five years old. Wow. So yeah. let's see. Uh... Uh, let me get over here. So it's going through some of your artwork. This is like one of your early pieces. That's actually two pieces. The one on the left with the blue and the red and such. It's uh, from 1961 when I was 19. And I was, uh, you know, influenced by and the schools were emphasizing <clears throat> abstract expressionists were the yeah. uh, failing teaching mode or the German school of the Bauhaus, which is a, you know, you heard of the Bauhaus. Yeah. So then on the right is my, it's like an abstract, you can kind of see in there, take on an African mask and uh, red, black, and green. And that was done the same year. They're very different, but it was me grappling with my history as a Judd, black artist, Etc. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That piece is very heavy. I mean, not heavy, like, <laughs> well, man, that's heavy. Literally heavy because it's a, oh, lot, okay. of, a lot of wow. wood. But it was dedicated to Malcolm X. Now, what are the actual dimensions? Because you can't tell from, is it small, uh, big, or? Not huge, huge, but it's weighs a lot it's like mm. probably five foot by four foot five foot wide four foot high and you started to mention malcolm x or something? it's it's called malcolm x and oh. i made it in 65 and i remember in my parents backyard setting it on fire <laughs> my, really? my, oh yeah you see you can see kind of burn parts like if you look in the middle and Parts of it are burned. I just well, used, I, I thought that was you know part of the look. It it's, is. It's I set it on fire on purpose. Oh, okay. okay with yeah. you know, like uh, the fluid that people use to do startup grills. You know, I sprayed yeah, some of that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, my parents they weren't home at that time. They were. The I see. Hey, I, I, at first, I thought you said your parents set this on fire. <laughs> Because I'm sorry, it's kind of like check yeah. that again. We're gonna burn this thing. Well, I told you, get another career. You gotta make money. To say here, the only other career I even halfway considered, and it shows up in my art in different ways, was being an astronomer. But anyway, uh -huh. this piece well, this, is owned this by got a little jabbo in there, right? That we'll start, the we'll talk about. And all the parts of it are made of. Uh, of uh, old artwork that uh, I had around that were it was a uh, flawed or it was uh, a mistake made or something like prints, but mm -hmm. I kept them because I could use them later in a collage like this. And it's about you know it's pretty big. It's about four foot by two and a half feet. Jerry De La Cruz owns this piece, mm -hmm. which I, I told him I'd buy it back. I really like this piece. It's very colorful, but that's that's from 1980. Yeah. Now this is this. Go ahead. The, the Jabo. I held a, a copy up that I have of it. This is That's the. the uh, or explain what this is. Yeah. Original layouts. And top is the cover. The Book of Jabo Revelations in Six Languages. Mondo Jethard. Mondo Jethard is my artist name. And then below that is a quote from uh, Joseph Conrad that I always like. And then the. Men, you see, that's the Hart family is going from my great grandfather, grandfather, father, oh, wow. brothers from 19, that photo is probably from 1954, 53, 54, when uh, my great grandfather was in Denver 
with his son. My great grandfather lived in uh, Tennessee and uh, Wildersville, Tennessee, which we all went to in 1958. That was wow. And how would you describe the Jabo character, your avatar, so to speak? Jabo is my avatar, and he's a direct lineage. It goes back to that story I told about in junior high school where the teachers freaked out about the black character. I mean, mm. they were concerned. I didn't say, I mean, they freaked out, but, they, you know. And I knew that the character with the lips had some kind of uh, resonance in uh, black history, uh, the stereotypes. Mm. And like uh, when I did a show at North Eastern University, Jabba was a big part of it. So a lot of the black artists, they were wondering about Jabba and the lips. And then, okay, that's fine. So now these are two pages from the book. Yeah, from the well, same book. Yeah, the book of Jabba. The bottom is my other avatar. The original drawing was of a woman in Africa, probably a, 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 from Mali, I would guess. A beautiful woman and a beautiful, I did a great drawing of her in 1976 that I use over and over. She was my other avatar that I, I named her Sapphire after Sapphire and Kingfish. Ah, okay. And, uh, Oh, go back I to just, the other one. Can you go back to the other one? On the top, the text on the left, in a way, gets into current events where the uh, U.S. population, the text is hard to read. You can't read the text here, but it's yeah, about yeah. how population changes in the U.S. are causing people to freak out who are white, Christian, European in general, not everybody, but mm. prophetic text. The Book of Jabo, yeah, it's, that's why it's called Revelations in Six Languages. The, okay, this is a... <laughs> it's like it's kind of your take on something else. <laughs> yeah, okay, the top is from a Japanese comfort book by a great ukiyo-e artist named Utamaro. Now, what right? is a comfort book? They were usually depicting some kind of sexual encounters, yeah, between uh, courtesans and some of the uh, mm. samurai men, and uh, they were very graphic. And the uh, the men always had, you know, big old dick and engorged and so on. But the uh, and Utamaro lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s. He was famous art. I mean, I love Japanese art. And then the mm. so the drawing below I did in late. In 1999, I put Jabo in place of uh, the man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's my take on uh, com uh, comfort books. It's a great drawing. It's a small I, drawing. I just had a thought that hit me in terms of the culture. Jabo reminds me of Sweetback. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a similar kind of vein of uh, uh, transgression. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> so this... Okay, on the left is my uh, chair I dedicated to Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth is a hero of mine. Her movie would be fantastic. I, mm -hmm. So it's a chair. And I think you saw it when you were here. You, I have a picture of you in that room. I've oh, dismantled, yeah, right. I've dismantled yeah. the chair because I'm going to rebuild it. It'll look similar to that, but I had to rebuild it to make it more uh, portable. You can take it apart and put it back together. Then on the right is a life-size Jabo and a big exhibit here is kind of a retrospective way back in 2004 here in San Francisco at a place called Somart South of Market Arts Gallery. And that's Jabo hanging upside down, life-size mm. in the middle of the show. It was, a, it was a hell of a show, hell of a show. <laughs> this is two different pieces. On the left is, I still remember the student named Jansen Francis. I took a picture when I was sub-teaching in 2002, one of my early digital cameras, and uh, he was in the counseling office. I was in there. I was like the samurai sub or the voodoo sub. I was the, the go-to sub for difficult middle school, especially the 
two in particular. So I took his picture. He's, he's an adult now, but uh, I don't even know where he is now. But I did the layout with some crude Photoshop I had and put the stars in the background. Then the on the right is Langston Hughes as a young man. It was a commissioned drawing. That's just a detail from the drawing. And uh, there's a ship in the background on the horizon because he was going to start being a world traveler. And... Oh, that's what that is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So these are two different pieces, but they have a similar. Yeah. Feel, you know. The of, ghost, uh, it works for me. The ghost of Gaswick. Yeah. It's, uh... No more dreams deferred. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. Then this, okay, it's another student. You know, I subtaught from uh, 20, year 2000 to 2016 because I had to replace my parade float building income. So, and I always took, you know, got their permission to take their picture. So I took her picture. I have thousands of pictures of middle schoolers being middle schoolers. They're so, their brains aren't even fully developed. You can't even take some of their behavior personally or you'll be mad all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, they talk to you like they talk to their friends, you know? So later, far as her pictures it was up leading up to uh, when the vote the presidential election in 2020 november 2020 so i was making all these imagery uh about just vote i wasn't saying for who i knew who i wanted but i just said mm -hmm. vote and then the image above her is a uh, part of a, a plate it's at the center of a plate that a wall hanging that reminded me of the girl in the picture so i put them all together and then the it, colors are like red you know yeah. sort of an african and then the circles represent indigenous uh, four directions like red black white yellow east west north south then the kid on the right <laughs> he's an adult now somewhere Eat your fruits and vegetables and be sure to vote between now and the third. <laughs> yes, I like that. Yeah, there's the vote again. Yeah, then that Interesting used, imagery here. An old imagery I used on a for another purpose, but it's like a, a painting of the heart is a part of a painting that I have on velvet that's not part of this. It's a big velvet painting that has to do with the nest purse. <clears throat> But I had these two water guns, and sometimes people's hearts get stopped up. You know, like violence is like a heart stopper. You know, it's like uh, mm -hmm. even stuff. Ah, ah, you know, it's, it was just, eh. But I was saying, no matter what, vote. And then on the right is <laughs> it's about a quote from uh, Ann Killian, who's a sports writer in the Chronicle about. It's part of a bigger article, but no one is happy that magical thinking about the virus hasn't worked. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> layout. And I was made. I made my own model. I had four different models of uh, the coronavirus that I made that I photographed in different settings that I mm -hmm. set up around here. You know, the left hard. is <laughs> me. You know, that's probably in two thousand four, so that's eighteen years ago, and. Uh, so that globe isn't really balanced on my head, but I had it hanging from a little chandelier in my place. And then I just took the photo so it would look and cut it down so it looked like it was balanced. And I'm looking at this little clown head on my finger and, uh, you know, laws of nature. Then the one on the right is uh, I'm in front of a Jabo artwork from 1984 called The Eye of the Beholder or eye and eye of the beholder. And so that's me with my gator mask pulled over my face with another mask. <laughs> off. I'm like, I'm protected. <laughs> so you made a reference uh, about teaching as a sub to supplement your work working on parades, right? Yeah, well, see, for from 1983, Really, for me, 1984 to 2003, built over 400 parade floats with Floatmeister, friend, artist, wow. Kip Ferris. Kip Ferris died in 2005. Wow. And uh, we were really good friends. I'm still 
really good friends now with his brother, Chris, his younger brother who lives in Denver, Chris Ferris. So when I, but the, building floats was so labor intensive. I mean, we built most of the floats for Chinese New Year. But how did that pop up? I mean, floats. oh, I'm going to build floats. Like, <laughs> Well, okay. Just one of those things. Well, in Denver, I moved to San Francisco in like 1989. So I was living in Denver. Kip and I had become friends in 1975. We met when I was trying to, you know, get on some woman that was his sometime girlfriend. I didn't know who she was. I and mean, we're in a park and he walks up and I'm like, hey, you know, we are, we hit it off. So he started building flows in 83. I didn't start with him that year. He wanted me to, but I was like, eh, it's cold in this garage and it's the Denver winter. You know, it's like the <laughs> uh, parade of lights in Denver in December. But by 84, I need, you know, the money. So I started working with Kip in 84 in Denver. Mm. So he upgraded, and he was, with the crew, we upgraded the look of the parade of lights in Denver. Great floats, cold as hell. From there, we went to Winter Carnival in St. Paul, Minnesota, Minnesota, where it's like really cold. <laughs> 20 below, and that's not the wind chill, you know, but we're in uh -huh. a warehouse. And from there, it was to San Francisco. And Kip moved here, and I'm like, okay, well, this is my gig. I moved to San Francisco in 89. We started doing the Chinese New Year Parade. And for them, mm -hmm. we built hundreds of floats over time, depending on the year, the dragon, the... oh, God. Well, actually, I got a couple of images here. <laughs> okay, that's, <laughs> that's, okay, so. Now that's something behind, is that part of the bicycle or is that behind you, the big? Uh, oh, so yeah. when I uh, stopped building, you know, stopped building flows full time, that's when I replaced the income. I had to start replace the income. That's when I started to sub teach. Mm -hmm. I had to replace the float building income. And sub teaching turned out to be great for me as far as the kids' interactions and all that. Of course, so in this photo is from about 20, maybe 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, by this time, I'm not making huge floats and Kip is, he's dead. He died in 2005 in December. Mm. You know, wow. he had a two year death rattle. That's a butterfly from uh, probably 2014. Wow. Uh, yeah, when I was doing, I was, then I was with this group called Hot Pink Feathers. They asked me to be with them, a dance troupe. <clears throat> and uh, mm -hmm. they had a theme each year and the parade itself would have a theme. And wow. Carno San Francisco Carnival. This is a- uh, Kind of small, but it's something, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, has to do with Kip and the float. So the, on the left is the basic float crew up in uh, Minnesota. Left to right is Errol Sorovsky, then Kip Ferris is the brother, then Terry, and then Kip is next to me, and Kip died in 2005, and then that's me on the right. We were all probably full of beer at that point. <laughs> Literally, I drank more. I drank more there. I don't know if it was the cold weather or what than I ever drank. And then on the right is a uh, thing I made for a Day of the Dead event here at a friend's gallery that doesn't exist anymore. They always had an annual Day of the Dead, Dia de los, Dia de los Muertos event with different artists. And so I had one that year for Kips. Hmm. From, uh, yeah. And those are some horses we built originally for the Chinese New Year Parade, Year of the Horse. And then we used them in Carnival for the King and Queen Parade. And then we refurbished them and built, jacked them up towed them all the way to Denver, Colorado from San Francisco out you know, on the back of a big U-Haul. And so that photo was in Denver outside the warehouse where they were part of a float that had to do with a, 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 a saint. I can't remember the saint's name now, but mm. yeah, big horses. <laughs> this is from 1990. <laughs> This is uh, from the, uh, now it's, you know, of the initials, LGBTQT, et cetera. Then the gay parade, 1993. I did a big J. Edgar Hoover and drag walking. 
inside Jaeger Hoover are two women. One was my girlfriend at the time, and the other one was an old friend from Israel, Mina, Israeli American. They're pushing J. Edgar down the street. On the left is the card I made in Oh, that's, that's J. Edgar Hoover. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's me by him. I'm dressed like, you know, Secret Service or whatever. I have a Got a tie on, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> we had these uh, two by fours with a dowel and they're all painted black so it looked like a walkie talkie. Okay. But yeah, the, that's a Chinese New Year parade, you're the dragon. Mm. And uh, wow. yeah, that was a beautiful float. And uh, those wheels actually turned when the float moved. Really, wow, beautiful looking. Yeah, it was a nighttime. That's, you're the tiger. <laughs> Way back, I think now we're in the year of the tiger also. So yeah, I think is, so. Yeah, it's, it's appropriate. That's from 1998 then. And uh, like I say, if we built 10 or 11 floats for the parade, so those two tigers were just props going up on a float. But uh, they, they came out beautifully. And, you know, Kip does, you know, did great work. I mean, he had beautiful, beautiful. health problems, but uh, we had a great crew. I and mean, sometimes crews of 20 people. Wow. And I'm looking delirious. And then this is the, you know, in 2006, Kip died in 2005. So I did, decided to do a memorial for Carnival here for Kip. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I designed and built the Phoenix rising out of the flames. And then mm -hmm. the woman is Kim, you know, was a girlfriend of Kip's. And she was also a dancer, performer, and used to perform mm -hmm. with a group called Bandaloop that would wow. hang off buildings and dance. And, wow. Yeah. Wow. So um, there's so much to talk about, but the last, the main last thing I, I want to cover is what I wound up performing in. I, I forget, I think I did it two years, right? You did this, they had this week. Oh, the urban, that well. You, that you would call, how, give the title of this week of performances and stuff that you yeah. had. <laughs> what would you call it? <clears throat> urban Aborigine Week. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay, after uh, <clears throat> after we did a show in Boston, uh, those artists wanted to have a show in Denver, the Boston artists. So it was 1981, so I was like, I wanted to put something together so it seemed like Denver was uh, happening 24 hours a day, you know. So I created Urban Aborigine Week, got all these people involved in Denver with no budget, parties, soirees, jabo awards, art shows. I probably weighed 160 pounds and running after I was just running around like eh, on pure energy. And the Aborigine came from uh, the word Aboriginal means in the beginning at the source. And I, initially, I was inspired by David Gulpalil, who was an Aboriginal actor. He might still be alive in Australia. And uh, But then I thought, in the big picture, we're all Aboriginal at some level, somewhere, somehow. So that's what I call it, Urban Aborigine Week. The first year was 1981. And it wow. went, you know, 283, 84, 85, I think 86 was... So a, a poster. <laughs> that's a poster. That's me. And I was actually, you know, that's a real picture. It wasn't staged. But uh, I had been in uh, jail for two days. And when they were, when I was getting out, I told the guy, and of course, he's like, I said, could I get a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs> no. He made a Xerox copy. I was there having wow, to wow. running, running lights on my bicycle and getting busted by the cops and not going to jail and then it turned into a bench warrant and so on and so forth. But yeah, so that was getting busted. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's the Bag Brothers. That's like a poster. That's me on the- Oh, that's you in that picture? On the left. Uh -oh. That's Jim Manning on the right. He's dead also. No, that's me on the right, and that's Jim Manning on the left. He died, you know, 
we had a, it was a funny thing. Those are real chickens. Wow. <laughs> that uh, we were saying, whose chicken is the biggest? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just from the local uh, Westward the Weekly, you know, Denver's version of Village Voice. That was an ad for Urban Aboriginal Week. Is that Jab is that Jabo in there? Too? Jabo and Sapphire. That's the deep Jabo. Okay. Oh, the deep Jabo. Because you got under, the beret. Always under surveillance. That's what that uh, aircraft overhead is, you know. Okay. And this is like a schedule. Yeah, it's like a all this stuff. Take schedule. There you are in the lower right hand yeah, side. Yeah, I, I did a piece out there I'd been doing called Moving About. So the yeah. lower left hand corner yeah. is the promo. Yeah. But the interesting uh, rundown of stuff. And then that is uh, also. That's a layout, but I'm, that's for that's probably just a layout just to make people think, what is this about? You know? Yeah, yeah, very dense with stuff. And so that's for the show that I did, right? Well, there you are. <laughs> you know, great pose. Yeah, a thing I had done a few times in New York and then um, came out there to do it. And... Is that the year that I met you at the airport with a sort of a, like, with a limousine? I was just about to say, I had this memory of getting off the plane and you had this thing. And our friend Judith friend Lay was performing that same she did yeah, a piece uh, with her grandfather too. About her grandfather, I think it was the same. And you you all there with, with stuff like like I was like Richard Burton or something, got off the plane like, Oh here he is <laughs> Hank Smith over here. Get out your you, cameras. You didn't tell me about that ahead of time. <laughs> This is from Urban Aboriginal Week. Now, this is one of the Mud Men. Mm. The Mud Men were created by Mark Antrobus, and I heard about it, and then I hooked him up with Urban Aboriginal Week, so they always perform at the top. They would start right at, when people were getting off work at a rush hour in Denver, they were on the mall, dozens of Mud Men and women dressed like Mud Men from uh, New Guinea. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Then that's... Or Mud Men, that's me on the right there, uh, doing what I did. Mud Men resting. Wow. That's uh, that's quite a, yeah, the memory coming out there, so I think I performed in some kind of art gallery space. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. part of it, and it was, it was straggling um, all over different parts of, uh, parts of, uh, parts of Denver, but. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so there's this Native American connection that you have. That's that, my thing. It right always, always has fascinated me. Um, yeah. It just, you can kind of like, what's, what's that about? And who, I've got some images well, and stuff, but you can talk about it before. The Nez Perce. In 1996, I read a story in uh, the New York Times, but it was in, a, in the Chronicle here, but from the New York Times. This guy was, the headings said, Nez Perce to return to homeland after 120 years in exile. And I was already a big fan of Chief Joseph, who was Nez Perce. So I'm like... No, just, just to explain, you're saying Nez Perce, like what, what, is, what is that word? What are, what are you saying, Nez? What is that? Nez Perce is the name of the tribe. Okay, so it's a tribe, okay. Tribe, they call themselves the Nimi'ipu. Nimi'ipu, okay. the people. Nez Perce is the name that stuck Okay. From French rappers in the late 1700s, because some local other tribes pierced their nose, and Nez Perce means pierced nose in French. Oh, okay. But the Nez Perce themselves didn't pierce their nose, but the name stuck to them. Mm -hmm. It's become their name in the public vein. So when I read about this return, it moved me. I was surprised. I read the paper every day, all kinds of things, but I was moved to track down some of the people in the article. And a man named Taz Connor, who was a descendant of uh, Chief Joseph, old Chief Joseph, and I finally contacted him. I was able, and he invited me to come up to the reservation in Pendleton. Where's that, Pendleton? Outside of Pendleton, Oregon. Okay. And so I drove up with my then girlfriend. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, met Taz. We hit it off. Taz died. He's dead. We hit it off, and he invited me to get involved with 
at first it was like I was going to do this essay with illustrations about the return of the Nez Perce to Wallawa. And the different tribe, you know, return to Wallawa. So it turned into, over the years, it turned into epic, epic, because the story is so epic. Even little things like the main general who uh, led the charge to evict them, ethnically cleanse them from the Wallawa Valley in 1877 was General O. O. Howard, Oliver Otis Howard, who was the founder of Howard University for wow. three days, the same, same one and the same, the general, one arm. He lost an arm in the Civil War. He had one arm. So it's turned into an epic. And uh, mm -hmm. right now I'm at like, I have like 214 fantastic pages. I'm going to finish it up wow. by early summer. I'll be done. It's beautiful. And then, and then once that's done. I'll continue to go up there. In fact, mm -hmm. this year I'm going to go up with my, uh, for my 80th birthday, my daughter and her husband, they want to go up. So my birthday's in April, but we'll go up in uh, July. Wow. And, uh, for the event called Tom Calix Celebration. Uh, so it's the first time images. it's been canceled because of the mm. corona. That's a piece I so made this... involving uh, Chief Joseph. That's Chief Joseph. Okay. Looks like he's on that white horse. And then on the right-hand side, as a viewer, right-hand side, that's his brother, right. Alakot, who is the warrior chief. And on the left is their father, to wake a cost, who was also known as Old Chief Joseph. When he oh, you mean on those, the, like the totems, the, the thing on either side that, that you're just talking about, the long, yeah, when you sit to left and right. Oh, I see. Yeah, on the left is a picture of uh, Old Chief Joseph, who became a Christian, then he became disillusioned with white people and tore up the Bible and went back to being to wake a cost. Chief Joseph, who everybody has heard of, or many people, is in the middle, and uh, those quotes are the words you see on there are all from things that they said you know like There's some uh, quotes at the very top and very bottom uh, and under the images right the you barely see it all the rest of the world i cannot leave my family behind you're being mm. asked to leave it's like if somebody knocked on your door right now hank and said you've got to go you know mm. that's what that's like you know mm. they've been there for ten thousand years and counted yeah you know? Yeah, that's a beautiful piece. It hangs in my kitchen. Wow. Yeah. So you see. Uh... Yeah. And then those are some uh, drawings. Uh, mm. Not all of them aren't involved in the nest purse, but on the lower, uh, you see, uh, lower left is that drawing I did of Chief Joseph. Then next to him is uh, Alakot, his brother, who was a warrior chief who died in the War of 1877. Above Chief Joseph is Tessie Williams, who I still is, hope is still with us. We'll I'll find out this year. She's must be. She's uh comes up there every year. She's Nez Perce. And the other drawings, oh, the guy on the top right is Joe Hallam. He's a white guy who's involved. He's about 91 now. Mm, he was wow. He's been involved with uh, the return of the Nez Perce. He's a native of Wallawa, but he, he lives outside of Portland now. The other drawing, oh, then the, the kid on the bottom, that's that kid is now an adult. The lower right hand corner. Yeah. Okay. See up in the top where there's a woman you can barely see with profile with glasses looking. On the top? Oh, the the top the Above, second from the left. And she's hidden yeah. by two other pictures. Yeah, she's behind two pictures. There's a right, right, okay. That's her that kid is her grandson. Oh, okay. He's now anti-vaxxer. That's how time flies. He lives in Texas somewhere. Good kid. Mm. He's an athlete. Mm. There's a Jab OS drawing that you see peeking out uh, down in below. The, in, I pointed at it like people can see it, but uh, I can't oh, in do the, it. In the, in the middle at the bottom? Yeah, you see his eye. The, the eyes. Oh, okay. Side, okay. About Jab But In Rwanda, when the, everything was, you know, the tragedy, Holocaust in Rwanda. One day in Time Magazine, there was a photo of some internal refugees in Rwanda. And in the picture was a guy who I said, this guy is Jabo in real life, you know. And mm. uh, 
I still have the picture. I cut it out. He was just in a line with refugees in uh, like 1994. So that drawing is from that picture of that guy. Oh, okay. Because when you said yeah. Jabo, it did look like a Jabo. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. All right. Then this is from the Longhouse. The drummers, they do uh, the Longhouse is like a, a church, a spiritual center <clears throat> up at the Tom Colleagues where everything takes place. And uh, I'm acquainted with a few of the people. Yeah, it's a beautiful building. It's fairly new. It's only been open for, it got built about four years ago. There's a kitchen attached to it. Yeah, and then there's a dirt floor. You can kind of see the dirt floor there. Hmm. <laughs> that's that's me. Uh, I, a place that I stay in the town of Velocity in Oregon. Beautiful layout with a uh, you know different kind of sheep and a guard llama and uh, generous people. Uh, let me stay there. Uh, Larry Forsgren and his wife died a few years ago. Uh, <clears throat> Beulah Winans. But so when I go back on this dirt road. I, ha I stopped my car with the lights shining and got out and, uh, <laughs> you know, this is for picture taken probably with my camera, not my phone. And I set the timer and then I like pose like. It, but it reminds me of that movie came out in the 90s, like the Blair Witch Project. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, where are they? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, wow, we, we covered a lot of territory. Oh, yeah, I, um, I appreciate that. And, I and I know there's, there's more to cover, but uh, I yeah. mean, the the the, um, the range of what you've done and stuff is continues to be interesting to me, you know, in terms of the, um, not only the forms and stuff, but just the different worlds and the, um, the well, history. There's a strand that connects them all, but it's created, What's that? The strand that connects them, which has to do with because sometimes instead of artists, I just say, I'm a maker of things. But yeah, yeah, you have yeah. A problem and you have a solution. So like whether it's building parade floats or like I'm getting ready for a show in Cortez, Colorado. Yeah. We have a friend, Sonia Horosco, which is interesting. There's a theme to it, has it, but me, it's a new artwork that will, it gets into my, uh, not regrets. It's like, okay, as a descendant of slaves, so many things were taken away. So if I meet somebody named Bill Yamamoto, even if his parents were in concentration camps during World War II, he still got the Yamamoto. See what I mean? So with me, my name could have been Judd Mbundele, but Fate intervened. So I'm doing this artwork where I have a fetish that I'm going to say, I'm telling you, because they won't see this until after. I'm creating something that I'll say, this is an African fetish symbol that has been in my family since the late 1700s. Whoever brought it over, we don't know. It's been kept secret. We've had it. That's my project now is to uh, create this mock story of a fetish I wish I had because this whole show is about people keeping things from their ancestry like uh -huh. so, like uh, Ukrainian ancestry have these things that her grandparents brought over and, and, and when is this supposed to happen uh it'll be the show will be in What's... July or June in uh, mm. you know in a uh, Cortez, Colorado, then in Denver after that. It's like 10 people involved. Uh, five, five writers and five visual artists. Oh. Yeah, and Sonia is both down there in Cortez, Colorado. Definitely keep me posted posted on that. Yeah. Now, a book is going to come out of it. There's going to be a book produced wow. by it. Wow. But uh, it was hard to explain exactly what. Can you hold on one second? So see this? Uh-huh. I'm gonna do a yeah. drawing about this. I got this at a thrift store. But in my uh, 
mock narrative of wishful thinking. I'm going to say this <laughs> has been in my family since the late 1700s. And wow. We're still protecting it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the hang. And Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, hopefully there's more years down the road of creativity for both of yeah. us, you know, <laughs> whatever's in the future, you know. And um, yeah, and. Um, I, I hope I didn't go off on too many tangents. Well, right. well you, you, you covered a lot of stuff, you know, it's a lot of interesting <laughs> things. There's a lot of interesting things that are out there. So, anyway, those who've been watching, you learned about Judd. And um, until the next time, you know, peace. <laughs>